Well, I like to lead with good news, so uh, let me assure you that at no point this evening will I read from or quote the poet Rumi. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be in Sacramento. It's a pleasure to be in California. I lived here for about 30 years before moving out about eight months ago. Lived over in Occidental. So I sort of feel like this is a hometown congregation. You may have seen the story in the B this morning. Uh, it was a reasonable detailing of my theory of evolution. I noticed that one expert wouldn't even give his name to allow his no comment to have attribution. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is no way to behave in the face of an ideological revolution. Anyway, um, and plus, it isn't even my weirdest idea. Um, <laughs> but that, that was left unmentioned, thankfully, in the article. But since the article dealt so specifically with evolution, and because that probably is my best candidate for entree into any kind of respectability, something I crave intensely in <laughs> every atom of my body, I thought I would uh, discuss it with you this evening and try and make it seem a little less absurd than, uh, than my critics might make it seem. First of all, let me lay out for you the, uh, the nature of the problem. Evolutionary theory tells us that we are some kind of advanced animal of some sort, and science has waged a noble struggle over the past 150 years to secure this position against all attacks by orthodox religious thinking, and yet, there is, uh, uh, after it's all said and done, the sense that if we are an animal, we are a very, very peculiar sort of animal indeed, a unique animal, an animal capable of language and coordinated planning, uh, an animal not bound to a particular uh, social or sexual style. We have monogamous human societies, polygamous societies. This is very different from animals. We have poetry, we have mathematics, we have drama, a whole spectrum of effects that is far from anything that we find in animal organization. And this problem has fascinated me for a long, long time as it's fascinated a lot of people. Uh, because obviously it's a great embarrassment to the theory of evolution that it can't account for human consciousness because after all human consciousness produced the theory of evolution. <laughs> so you see it's a significant failure there. Uh, so uh, obviously if you accept the basic rules of the evolutionary game, which are that there is random mutation, which means gene drift, mixing of genes through sexual reproduction, uh, cosmic rays which cause birth defects and mutations, this sort of thing, and natural selection. And these two factors, natural selection and uh, and mutation are sufficient to account for praying mantises, chipmunks, tropical rainforests, but not us. And the reason is that we emerge too quickly from the background of the rest of ordinary nature. Uh, in the space of about two billion years, the human brain doubled in size. And Lumholtz, who is an orthodox evolutionary biologist, calls this uh, the most dramatic transformation 
of, the, of a major organ of a higher animal in the entire history of life. And it happened to us. It happened to that very organ that is responsible for the theory of evolution. So what extraordinary confluence of um, factors could have come together there to take a, a, essentially an arboreal monkey, an ape of some sort, that had been at an evolutionary climax in the canopy of the rainforest for a couple of million years, what extraordinary set of factors could then set that creature marching down the road toward, you know, Elvis, the internet, Bill Clinton, and uh, all the rest of it? Well, you would imagine, or I imagined when I first started thinking about this, that there must be some huge edifice of established theory that we have to go up in there and blow up. Surely somebody has, has staked out this ground and made some kind of an argument about human consciousness. Well, in terms of science, not, or almost not. I mean, in terms of religion, it's simple. I mean, God made us from the clay of the earth. In terms of science, the best shot is pretty weak soup from my point of view. Here's, here's what science is telling us. That when you throw something, you have to plan. Because once you let go of whatever it is you're throwing, you can no longer control it. And so because we were small and weak and hunted in packs, we learned to throw like hell at very large, onrushing, woolly uh, fellow mammals of various sorts. And you had to plan your throw. Consequently, we developed brain capacity to do this and had enough left over to invent quantum physics, paint the Mona Lisa, invent the phonetic alphabet, philosophy, religion, and all the rest of it. Uh, in other words, it was the coordination of the hand and the eye to the throwing arm, this is what the orthodox folks tell us, that gave us this extra brain capacity that we sort of then managed into human civilization. Well, notice that this would make the pinnacle of the evolutionary ladder uh, the gum-chewing big league baseball pitcher. <laughs> because, you know, he can put that pill right across the plate at high speed uh, time after time. As somebody who learned everything they know about sadomasochism in PE class, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not really ready to embrace uh, this theory. It, it definitely runs against my paradigm. So he, I, I've built another story, and it, to my mind, meets the, uh, the objections, answers the question, where did consciousness come from? But instead of doing it very nicely and neatly, it raises in the very act of answering this question, other questions, maybe more closer to home, questions that reflect on our social organization, our politics, how we treat each other, in the here and now, even with implications for the future. But we'll get to that. For the moment, let me just run through this for you. There's a sort of a basic situation that all theories of evolution have to come to terms with. And this is that our remote proto-hominid primate ape ancestors uh, lived and developed in Africa. If you have an, a non-African theory of human origin, and there are such things, but the evidence is strongly against you. If it were stock, I'd sell. Uh, the evidence is pretty strong that whatever happened 
that brought us out of the animal body. It happened in Africa. Well, all animals tend to, uh, and plants for that matter, tend to reach uh, evolutionary climax and occupy a niche and stabilize in that niche. Cockroaches, ants achieved this hundreds of millions of years ago and have not changed greatly since. Most of biology is this iterative occupation of a climaxed niche. Very little of biology is the pushing forward into, into radical new forms, new species, still rarer, new, new genera. Uh, for that, there has to be disruption of some sort of the environment. And it can be the meandering of a river or an asteroid strike or the retreat of a glacier, uh, something which creates open land. Well, for many, for five, six million years now, the African continent has been slowly drying. And uh, three million years ago, it was covered by rainforest at the equator from east to west. Uh, slow, and that was the, uh, the environment of the, of the uh, human ancestor types. They were canopy dwelling, they were fruit eating, they ate some percentage of insects, composed their diet, they had a pack signaling repertoire that was fairly complicated by animal standards. And there they were, happily living in the canopy. But Africa began to dry up, and they came under nutritional pressure. Now, simpler animals, insects, for example, when their food source is withdrawn, they usually buy the farm. They don't have much flexibility of diet. If you've ever tried to raise caterpillars into butterflies for your children, you know that if you give the caterpillars the wrong leaves, they just can't make any sense out of it and they die. Uh, more advanced animals, when confronted with dietary pressure or disappearance of ordinary food supplies, before they give up the ghost, they will uh, experiment with other food sources in the environment. Now, the reason this isn't normally done is thought, the reason animals are conservative in their food choices, it's thought to be a way of avoiding uh, mutational influences in the form of uh, tertiary chemicals, toxins, viruses, and things like this that would be in, food, in unusual foods. One of the things that accompanies our acquisition of consciousness is gastronomy, the appreciation of flavor, the approach to food that makes it an art. Animals don't do this. They're just trying to get enough protein to keep the old engines running. The notion of flavoring uh, is counterintuitive to animals. And flavoring is probably, in part, a mutagenic influence to our diet. When our remote ancestors came under environmental pressure, their environment was shrinking, the rainforest was being replaced by grasslands, and nutritional pressure, their ordinary diet of fruit and insects was being um, restricted, they began exploring this new environment of the grasslands. And this is the era of knuckle walking, turning into bipedalism. It's the era of the coordination of binocular vision, so forth and so on. There was a paper published recently which anticipates my point, but I can't wait to hit you with it. A paper published recently about canopy-dwelling monkeys who only leave the canopy for the acquisition of one particular food and the food they will come to the ground for and risk predation is mushrooms. So 
it seems perfectly reasonable to suggest that our remote ancestors exploring the new environment of the grasslands would have encountered, as you would if you were to go to the, to the tropics, uh, psilocybin-containing mushrooms growing in the dung of cattle. Many uh, dung-growing so-called coprophytic, coprolytic mushrooms produce psilocybin, among them Strophera cubensis, which is one of the largest and pandemically distributed of these mushrooms. I'm sure that our early ancestors also tested other kinds of food. They were testing everything. Uh, they were digging for corms with pointed sticks. Uh, and I'm sure there were many ecological and medical disasters as a consequence of this. For instance, uh, the birth control steroids in modern birth control pills are produced by Dioscorea vines grown on plantations in Mexico. Well, Dioscorea is the family of uh, sweet potatoes. Imagine a, a hungry band of primates that come upon a patch of sweet potatoes that are heavy in these steroids. It would raise holy havoc with their reproductive cycle. It would interfere with menstruation, ovulation, lactation, fertility, and, uh, you know, human genetic history is the story of many such uh, encounters with mutagenic influences in the environment, most of them catastrophic, detrimental, lethal. But in some few cases, there would have been uh, salutary results advantages conferred upon the animals that accept these new foods into their food chain. And, and I want to particularly emphasize psilocybin because I believe it's the key. You see, we're looking for some kind of factor which could have exploded the human brain size at a rate 10 times faster than evolution normally takes place. So it's going to be an unusual situation. Perhaps the need to throw a boulder a distance accurately, or perhaps contact with an unusual food item or drug containing plant. But it was something unusual. If it weren't unusual, it wouldn't have taken this planet a billion and a half years to bring forth its first intelligent species. Well, so let's look at psilocybin then in a little more detail. It has a number of properties not specifically related to its psychoactivity that make it an ideal candidate for a catalyst for the emergence of consciousness in an advanced animal. First of all, and at the early stage of human invasion of this new grassland environment, proto-hominid invasion, I should say, uh, we were testing foods. We would certainly have tested this food. I've seen these things the size of dinner plates in the Amazon after a rain, and they are silvery with blue and purple shading. They are the most dramatic thing in the environment, whether you know anything about them as, as psychoactive agents are not. Certainly, they would have been tested for food. I've seen uh, baboons in Kenya investigating cow pies and flipping them over because beetle grubs nestle underneath them. So cow pies are a natural vector for hungry baboons so that everything is in place. It's, it's trivial to suggest otherwise, I would maintain. Okay, the first quality of psilocybin, which isn't specifically related to its psychoactivity, is that in small doses, doses that are the kind you might obtain if you were just sort of eating it along with little roots, grass roots, small bugs, so, you know, so forth and so on, 
visual acuity is improved. Specifically, edge detection is improved. Well, now, it seems to me you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that if you're in a highly competitive evolutionary environment in grassland, an environment characterized by large predators hunting cats and also characterized by small ungulate prey, that having an increased sensitivity to edge movement might make the difference between whether or not you live to tell the tale or you become somebody's dinner, or it would certainly make the difference between going home empty-handed and taking dinner home with you. So a factor which enhanced edge detection on those animals accepting that food supply into their food chain, they would have uh, a slightly increased chance of evolutionary success as opposed to the non-psilocybin members of their group. And this increased hunting uh, success would tend to outbreed the non-psilocybin using members of the group. At slightly higher doses, uh, in highly sexed animals like primates, uh, all alkaloids are what are called CNS stimulants, central nervous system stimulants. That means that they produce arousal. And in sexually extremely active animals like primates, arousal means uh, erection, usually in the male, usually followed by hanky-panky. What anthropologists and primatologists call successful instances of copulation. <laughs> well, again, what is this? It's a second factor tending to outbreed the non-psilocybin using members of the population. They're now definitely moving to the rear of the parade. They don't have as much hunting success. They don't have as much food for themselves and their offspring. They're not having as much sex, so they're not having as many offspring. And, you know, in terms of, of rising and falling numbers, those that have some allergy, prejudice, or fear of, uh, of the mushroom are, are just being shunted out of the breeding population. Well, at still higher doses, approaching effective doses of 20 milligrams or more, in other words, 4 grams dried and up, or 45 grams wet and up, uh, hunting is out of the question. <laughs> Sex is something you can consider, but it's out of the question. And you are basically nailed to the ground in a state of mind which we, for all of our sophistication, our logical positivism, our superconducting super colliders and all the rest of it, haven't a clue as to what it is, what it means, what its implications are. The full-blown psychedelic experience of which we can only speak in, in terms of uh, religious hierophany, epiphany, apocatastasis, and all those other great Greek words, uh, ataraxia. You know, in other words, we like it, but we don't understand it. And it is, therefore, uh, the basis for religion. Well, uh, so right there, you have a three-step process driven by nothing more than hunger and curiosity that leads remote primate ancestors to a confrontation with what Rudolf Otto called the holy other, the holy, the numinous, the transcendental. And, uh, uh, you know, this is on slightly less firm ground, but in my own personal experience and having collected psychedelic experiences lifelong, I feel confident in saying that at high doses, psilocybin causes glossolalia. Glossolalia is 
syntactically structured language-like behavior in the absence of meaning. Uh, speaking in tongues is what Christian fundamentalists call it, but they don't have a monopoly on it. It's ancient. It occurs in all cultures. It's shamanic. And what it is, is it's a kind of neurological seizure where linguistic organization spontaneously is verbalized. No animal does this. It must have something to do with the acquisition of language by human beings. And what I think is going on is that probably language was uh, entertainment long before it was meaning. But it's a kind of tuneless singing. And that having discovered that we could make an almost endless repertoire of small mouth noises, we did this for each other, for amusement, for to uh, pass the time. I mean, God knows there was a lot of it. And <laughs> it, it probably was very late in the evolution of this ability that some very tight-assed rational type <laughs> said, you know, we could attach a specific meaning to a specific sound, and then every time I made that sound, you'd know what I meant, and then you could go and get it for me. <laughs> you see? <clears throat> it's a sort of, it, it's the, as long as you're up, get me a grants theory of language. Uh, so, so that's the basic idea, and I, I really believe that sometime in the last 50,000 years, before 12,000 years ago, a kind of paradise came into existence, a situation in which men and women, parents and children, people and animals, human institutions and the land uh, all were in dynamic balance and not in any primitive sense at all. Uh, language was fully developed. Poetry may have been at its climax. Dance, magic, poetics, altruism, uh, philosophy, there's no reason to think that these things were not practiced as adroitly as we practice them today. And it was under the aegis of the boundary-dissolving influence of psilocybin. We were nomadic. We were breeders and, and caretakers of cattle. We worshipped the great goddess. We followed a yearly round in a vast grassland cut by crystal streams that were washing down out of the, the higher altitudes. And we were probably black as your hat, for that matter. Uh, and it was great. Well, if it was so great, what happened? Well, uh, the very forces which created this situation, and you will recall what it was. It was the drying of the African continent, forcing us out of the trees, forcing us to change our diet, forcing us to accept a, a dung-growing mushroom. Uh, and there were other factors forcing us into consciousness as well. When we became omnivorous, the first form of consciousness is having the point of view of your prey. Predatory animals have the highest form of animal consciousness, big cats, but it's consciousness of the exterior world. Psilocybin forced us beyond that into consciousness of the, imi the imaginal world, the world of the imagination inside our heads. What happened was um, the mushroom faded. The climate changed. What had been everywhere became seasonal, moved into the rain shadows of mountains, uh, became the prerogative of a special class of people called shamans who were like the 
the designated hitters for dealing with the uh, hyperspace of the mythos. Uh, in other words, over millennia, the, the, the connection went from available to everyone all the time to ever more tenuous, ever more tenuous, finally faded out entirely. It's even more complicated than that, because surely people would have, as they saw this happening, make attempts to preserve the mushroom. And in a world without refrigeration, the only effective way to do this is uh, preservation in honey. You can dry mushrooms, but in a world without hermetically sealed peanut butter jars, drying is a very short-term strategy for preservation. The only thing which will really work is preservation in honey. The problem there is that honey itself, especially aboriginal honeys, which have a lot more water in them than what you get in those little plastic bears at the A&P, uh, aboriginal honeys are very runny. And so what do they do? They themselves have the capacity for turning into a psychoactive substance, alcohol. But alcohol promotes a completely different set of cultural values and attitudes than psilocybin. Uh, psilocybin is a boundary-dissolving hallucinogen. Uh, mead alcohol uh, gives an enhanced uh, sense of verbal acuity in the presence of lowered sensitivity to social cues. Uh, in other words, uh, one can make an ass of oneself. But, <clears throat> but there's something I want to go over with you that's really important in all this to me. And that is, this isn't simply the story of how an intoxicant promoted consciousness and then we fell into history by losing that intoxicant and went on to other intoxicants with consequences to be evaluated. It's that, but it's more because psilocybin had a very, very peculiar effect over and above what I've mentioned so far. And it is this over and above effect that makes my theory so controversial and so, uh, and academics, I think, so phobic of it because it rips open a whole can of worms. And th this is the problem. All uh, primates, clear back to squirrel monkeys and old world monkeys. All primates form dominance hierarchies. This means that the sharp fanged, hard bodied young males control everybody else. The women, the elderly, the sick, the children, homosexuals, everybody finds their place somewhere in this dominance hierarchy run by these uh, dominant alpha males. We are no different. Uh, we also, as we sit here this evening, operate under this kind of a social organization. I mean, we complain about it, we analyze it, we are aware of it, but we live under it. It's how it is. So here is my suggestion that what psilocybin did was it changed behavior. It interfered with primate behavior. Specifically, it interfered with this tendency to form monogamous pairs and dominance hierarchies. And so the ordinary tendency of the primates to organize themselves that way was interrupted medicated out of existence, if you like, vaccinated against, if you like, by the presence of psilocybin in the diet. And uh, this, over this, this overemphasizing or chemical accentuation of sexuality occasioned by the arousal of the psilocybin was sufficient to dissolve the ordinary tendency toward monogamy. 
and replace it with an orgiastic sexual style, or they coexisted simultaneously. I mean, who knows? We weren't there. It's sort of the way I imagine it is that at every new and full moon, there were group mushroom parties, which basically simply got out of hand <laughs> regularly. And, and so the monogamous pair bond would be at, under pressure, if not completely uh, eliminated. Many cultures have this, even to this day. I mean, in a sense, Mardi Gras is a, a festival where the rules are dissolved and nobody is supposed to go to their spouse the Monday after and say, you know, was that you I saw dressed as Marie Antoinette? And uh, <clears throat> because, you know, the rules are, there is permission to break the rules, and many societies do this. Uh, the result of an orgiastic style like that is uh, men cannot trace lines of male paternity. And so there is a tremendous social glue, a tremendous uh, force for the cohesion of community. Men don't then think in terms of my children. They think in terms of our children, the children of the group. And under the aegis of this group, this polymorphic, polymorphic sexual style, group, uh, child care and, uh, and extended family rearing, we produced everything that we think of as human, that we value. Our art, our music, our philosophy, our sense of each other's worth, uh, body painting, tattooing, piercing, all the accoutrements that distinguish us from animal existence were put in place when we had a different kind of mind than we have now. We didn't have a mind that favored role specialization and male dominance and anxiety over female sexual activity related to feelings of male ownership. That all came later. We became human beings in this other world of, of values and psychological attitudes. Problem is, that, as I say, the mushroom faded. But by the time it had faded, uh, we, we were no longer the wordless symbiotes of cattle, the, the barely sentient hunters of, of the African plain. By the time we were finished with the mushrooms, we had language, we had social institutions. And, but what we began to lose was, you know, you can get as wet-eyed as you want about it, but respect for each other, a sense of each other's individuality, a sense of love, a sense of community. And it must have been, though it happened over a long period of time, very much like what we're living through now, a sense that people are, you know, no damn good and getting worse. A sense that, you know, why can't we be as we once were? Where is our sense of each other? Where is our ability to care for each other? So forth and so on. I wrote a book called uh, Food of the Gods, in which I tell this story in the first third of the book that I just told you. And then I show that what history is essentially is, is a careening, out-of-control effort to find our way back to this state of primordial balance. One of the things that marks us as humans, that is unique, is our obsessions with drugs, our ability to addict. We addict not only to substances, we addict to each other. We addict to ideologies, Marxism, Christianity, skinkism, as practiced in Washington, uh, whatever. Uh, and we addict to each other. 
you know, I mean, I am a romantic uh, with the best of them, but I can't help noticing that a broken heart and a heroin withdrawal show very similar presentations. <laughs> really, insomnia, sweating, sense of diminished self-esteem, hysteria, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very similar. We, so a, a psychologist looking at a person with an addictive syndrome will say, well, you were damaged in childhood. There is some trauma there that you're, you're trying to compensate. You're trying to compensate. Well, I'm not that keen on all this psychologizing, but I do think that we could apply this model to ourselves on a grand scale. We were essentially torn from the Gaian womb, thrust into the birth canal of history, and expelled sometime around the fall of the Roman Empire into the cold, hard world of modern science, existentialism, and all the rest of it. And uh, uh, we have searched the planet for substances which would assuage our sense of pain. And there are things out there you know, alcohol, the whole morphine family, so forth and so on. But these things always have consequences. There's a price to be paid. Uh, the, the very knowledge of psilocybin was lost to the entire planet, except for some tribes in the, in the Mexican mountains, uh, for several millennia until Valentina and Gordon Wasson went in the uh, uh, early 1950s and found these mushrooms and brought them out. And then Albert Hoffman, who had earlier discovered LSD, synthesized the compound and made it available. That was 55. Well, by 66, all human research with these things had been forbidden. We have, it's not that science mowed this field and moved on, it's that uh, science has never really been here. Uh, we haven't looked at the implications of diet on early human evolution. We don't have a theory for the evolution of consciousness of any consequence, and yet you know, the factors I've laid out for you, increased visual acuity, an impact on sexual and social behaviors, a triggering of glossolalia-like phenomena in the presence of a boundary-dissolving psychedelic experience, these are catalysts sufficiently dramatic that inculcated into a cultural style. I think they explain a great deal about where we came from and who we are. Now, the, the irony of all of this is uh, that we live in a society that has made pr all practically any discussion of this illegal. Certainly, if I were to end this lecture by handing out doses of psilocybin, I would be <laughs> gently taken by the elbow and led away forever. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the Western mind is particularly phobic of this, uh, of this subject. I mean, we have bent our laws so that people can jump out of airplanes in the pursuit of thrills, so that they can bungee cord off major highway bridges and freeway overpasses. Be so concerned are we to fulfill society's need for thrills uh, but this is something else. It provokes all kinds of alarmed reactions, and perhaps you believe unfairly. I think that when you examine the situation, it's possible to understand very clearly why this is such a social issue. Because what these things do, if you look, and now I'm slightly broadening my wrap to include other psychedelics besides psilocybin. What these things do, if you had to generalize 
100,000 psychedelic experiences, the ones where people thought they were God, the ones where people had to be taken to the ER room and have their stomach pumps, the, all of them. If you generalize, what, the, what these substances do is they dissolve boundaries. They dissolve boundaries. If you love it, you'll love it. If you hate it, you'll hate it. But that's what they do. They dissolve boundaries. Now, the reason this provokes a lot of social anxiety is because all societies are about the maintenance of boundaries.